Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, that's for art. Um, we're going to read more of our book, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution. We're on the very long chapter of Chapter 5, um, which is called Lip Service to the Public Health, and we are actually on page 101. I'm going to get right to it. I'll try to read for about 10 minutes or so. Um, I'll put my glasses on instead of taking these guys off. So we're on a new subtitle called The Study of Too Few Cases May Spell Disaster. In the human being, the situation is even more outrageous and overtly deceptive. We have already alluded to the study of 100 people where zero cases will be expected 9 times out of 10. And if zero cases are observed in one sample of 100 people, the pronouncement of safe is made, when indeed disaster may be the correct answer. Obviously, it may require 10,000 persons observed or 100,000 persons observed to discover directly that one out of 1,000 are developing cancer as a result of a specified dose of radiation. Does this justify the pronouncement of safety because of a total inadequate set of observations of 50 or 100 persons? Fortunately, we have not reached the Nazi principles of human experimentation under which we would specifically design experiments to radiate 10,000 or 100,000 persons just to get this answer. Remember, this was written in 1970. I think we've crossed that line already. We fervently hope that point will never ever be reached. But it is even more cruel and more inhumane to pronounce safety from a totally inadequate set of, of 50 or 100 persons and from that to go ahead to an allowable exposure of 200 million people at such a radiation level. This represents an experiment of inhumanity of the greatest arrogance and disdain. And to add insult to injury, once the whole 200 million people are exposed, it becomes impossible to ever learn the effect of the radiation upon them because there is no unexposed group left for comparison. So I guess that's what's happened. 2011 gave them that perfect opportunity. The credulity of the average thinking citizen might be strained in trying to believe that such a massively inept approach characterizes health and safety considerations in atomic energy. An illustration will help. After presenting our evidence that 32,000 extra cancers and leukemias could result from the currently allowable radiation levels to Senator Muskie's subcommittee on air and water pollution. We were invited over to the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy for some discussions on the hazard of radiation, of, uh, for some discussions of the radiation hazard question. Chairman Holyfield of the JCAE helped demonstrate for us how widespread and pernicious erroneous thinking can be in leading it to potentially disastrous public health results. In this case, even the chairman of the supposed watchdog congressional committee appears to have been thoroughly taken in by the inappropriate kind of evidence concerning hazard. In quotes, how can you two sit here and tell us that the currently allowable amount of radiation can finally lead to 32,000 extra cancers of extra cases of cancer and leukemia per year? How can you tell us that anyone would be hurt when we know that the standards were set as follows? First, the injury level was determined. Then we went 10 times below that and then 10 times below that, and the standards were set there. If we're 100-fold below the injury level, 
How do you two come up with a prediction of 32,000 extra deaths per year? Unquote. Certainly a fair question by Chairman Hollyfield. Chairman Hollyfield is fed an old chestnut. That's the subtitle. My lips feel weird, man. I got this weird lipstick on tonight. Yeah. Um, I'm going to keep going. We know how we got our numbers. It was very simple. We had studied the direct results of how many cancers and leukemias had already occurred in people after, exposed, after either exposed to radiation from atomic bombs, like in Hiroshima or Nagasaki, or from medical exposure. Any fourth grader could take that evidence and arrive at the same number we did. Even the AEC could if it would tr but try. It isn't that the calculation is hard. So we said properly, Congressman Holyfield, have you ever been misinformed? We don't know precisely how you got the wrong information about cancer risk, but we do know it's wrong. On leaving, Goffman said to Tamplin, where in the world did Congress and Holyfield get that rubbish about the standards being set a hundred times below the danger point? What danger point? Whoever proved that one? Beats me, said Tamplin. You and I have spent a few years poring over the evidence, and it couldn't possibly have escaped us. So we, we resolved to go right back to California and find out what mythology had been fed to the congressman who chairs the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. It didn't take long. Over a period of years, the JCAE had held extensive hearings on the general subject of radiation hazards. Hearings containing elegant testimony that should clearly have dispelled confusions in the congressman's mind. Our copies of those hearings were already worn thin by our previous perusal. We must look. We must find out who misled Chairman Holyfield. Just as we suspected, the old story of supposed safe thresholds of radiation was the culprit. Years ago, a number of workers had been exposed to radium, radium salts as a result of working in the dial painting industry on luminous dial watches. After a period of years, such people started to die off of bone cancers as a result of radium, radium radiation poisoning. For those exposed to high amounts of radium, the death rate was appalling. Some workers, small numbers of them, had been exposed to very small amounts of the radium poison. By simple proportional calculations for one of these groups, a handful of people of 50 or so, one estimates that 0 0.01 or one hundredth of a case of bone cancer is expected. Obviously, with so few people, you can't observe one in a hundred of a cancer case. Being humans just aren't packed that way. And as related above, most of the time 50 people are studied with such expected numbers. Zero cases will be observed. Instead of realizing that this proves nothing about radiation hazard, precisely the wrong interpretation was made, namely, that this amount of radiation was harmless, that this was below the, quote, magic safe threshold, unquote. Utter nonsense. So many great scientists, including Archer, Morgan, Parker, Hams, there's an asterisk with a whole bunch of other scientists, all had rejected the radium dial painter story as being at all indicative of any safe amount of radiation. They said so right in Chairman Holyfield's radiation hearings in print. The International Commission on Radiation, Radiological Protection rejected it. The FRC, including the chairman, rejects it again and again. But 
Oh, how attractive such non-evidence is to the atomic energy promoter seeking any safe port in a storm. Chairman Hollyfield is not to be criticized for having take, taken in by such purported evidence for safe thresholds of radiation. Chairman Hollyfield admits he is a protagonist in favor of atomic energy and try as he may to escape it, thy dynamic of hope, seeking to see only its beauty in his dream child, shuts out the seamier aspects. And so we indeed understand Chairman Hollyfield's remarks to us, and we wrote him the following letter, which was published. University of California, Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, Livermore, California, December 1, 1969. Honorable Chet Holyfield, Chairman, Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, U.S. Capitol, Washington, D.C. Dear Chairman Holyfield, Both of us were deeply honored by the opportunity of some two hours of frank and substant substantive discussion with you and your colleagues last week. Especially is this so because both of us are intense admirers of the devoted and untiring efforts of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy to bring to light all the true facts concerning radiation hazards. Ha! The various hearings you have held are unequaled as, mon as a monumental contribution to the public welfare and health. In our discussion, you asked us a very specific question. How can you tell us there is a potential hazard at certain dosages when we have been assured that the hazard level is approximately 100-fold higher? We answered, Congressman Holyfield, we believe you have been misinformed. We know that you needed more, more, an we know that you needed more answer than that. Based upon the evidence and calculation, we knew what we were trying to, what we were saying had to be true, but we did not know how it had come about that deep misinformation had come to the Joint Committee. We resolved, therefore, to go right home and find out how this had indeed come about. After careful study of many of the hearings of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, we believe that we have a complete understanding of the specific nature of the misinformation. It is the purpose of this letter and the attachments to explain all of this to you. And we are prepared to defend our analysis of this situation in any format the Joint Committee would, like to, would, would find helpful. We believe, however, that our analysis will speak for itself. Specifically, we refer to the radium dial painter study reported to you by Dr. Robert Hasterlich at the hearings, the 87th Congress, Part 1, page 325, and by Dr. Robley Evans at the hearings, 90th Congress, Part 1, page 265. Dr. Hasterlich interpreted his findings correctly when questioned by Congressman Price. Dr. Evans, in our opinion, grossly misinterpreted his own data, but undoubtedly with total sincerity of purpose. Yeah, right. That's for sure. You can't, I guess you can't say anything bad about another scholar. <clears throat> our analysis attached shows both sets of data consistent with each other. In striking contrast with Dr. Evans' claim that the data indicate a threshold of radiation below which cancer doesn't occur, our analysis indicates nothing of the sort. Number one, neither the Hasterlick data nor the Evans data can even remotely be construed to suggest that any safe threshold below which cancer doesn't occur. Number two, the data from both researchers are perfectly consistent with the cancer production right down to very low doses. 
and this could very well be a linear relationship over much of the entire dose range from low doses upward. We are both dismayed that the editorial board of the British Journal of Radiology and the editorial board of the Health Physics did not catch the indefensible claim of Dr. Evans that a threshold exists. Worse yet, we are dismayed indeed by Dr. Evans' statement that his, quote, proof, unquote, of a threshold is the cornerstone of all radi radiation protection standards. If this be true, then there is little wonder that the cornerstone of radiation protect protection standards is made of quicksilver. We believe, after a careful study of this particular fiasco, you may be more understanding of our total lack of confidence in the underlying basis for existing radiation standards. However, we are certain everyone concerned in informing you was well-intentioned. Since we know this information will be of great interest to the AEC, we feel you will approve of our sending copies of this letter and the enclosures to Chairman Seaborg and Dr. John, John Totter, assuring you of our deepest commitment to constructive assistance to help you in your gravely important responsibilities. We are sincerely yours, John W. Goffman, Arthur R. Tamplin. Wow, were those guys naive or what? Seriously. Okay, back to the letter. Thus, we learn further that the strange phenomena one must necessarily cope with in dealing with the environmental crisis. The human mind has many mysterious compartments, and at the right time it shows a remarkable ability to close out that which one wants so desperately not to believe is there. Can we say Fukushima? If this were all, one might hope to break through the stone wall, but there's more. An even better game is played by the atomic energy and other technological promoters. It's called Poisoningly, Poisoning You Slowly Isn't Nearly As Bad As Poisoning You Fast. <coughs> wow. Poisoning you slowly isn't nearly as bad as poisoning you fast. That's their justification. Wow. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me go back and read that paragraph again. If this were all, one might hope to break through the stone wall, but there's more. An even better game is played by the atomic energy and other technological promoters. It's called Poisoning You Slowly Isn't Nearly As Bad As Poisoning You Fast. What's more, there is some basis for the credibility of this story, provided that you can sift fact from fancy. Long ago, in the early history of radiation and radioactivity, it was found that a certain dose of radiation would produce reddening of the skin. But the same dose, divided into two applications, did not. A higher total dose was required if split into two portions. And in producing acute radiation sickness, which occurs from massive overdose of radiation, it is perfectly true that spreading the same dose over a prolonged period affords protection against such radiation sickness. But one must ask the real meaning of such phenomena. Oh my gosh, it's 18 minutes. I should stop. We are on page 107. No proof that repaired body cells won't become cancerous. Wow. I'm finding this book completely fascinating. I don't know about you guys, but um, I'll end here. Chai, you guys, put your courage feet on. We're going to seriously need it because there it's come. I mean, it's here. Uh. <laughs> Be happy. Happiness is resistance. <laughs>